Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truin. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. The sound of you doing is music to our ears. Order on the Home Depot app and get convenient delivery so you don't have to stop doing when you need something. The Home Depot app, how doers get more done. This week, we have some tips for you on removing vines from stucco. Can be quite a challenge, but we have a few ways to make it a little easier. Also, we have a homeowner that's battling the moles and the voles. What do you do about it? We'll tell you our recommendation. Also, some great looking garage floor coatings that you can use inside or maybe outside on the patio. Also, we're going to share with you our four seasons of homeownership spring checklist. It's pretty manageable, and you'll want to know all about what to do at your home. Joe, what about that simple solution? Well, Danny, now that spring is here, we often tell people that the most important first step when you're planting a garden or taking care of your lawn is to do a soil test. And while you can't buy a soil test, I'll show you how to make a DIY soil test with just some baking soda, vinegar, and water. All you have to do is head into the pantry, it sounds like. Right. Okay, well, let's get started. I'll tell you, Joe, I guess we uh, have to talk a little bit about the lumber prices. we got an update yeah, on I think we do. all of that. And, you know, a year ago, the rising price of lumber drove the price of construction, especially new home construction, way up. And, you know, this increased prices and supply shortage kind of slowed down construction considerably. And this was a little over a year ago. Then, in summer 2021... The prices fell back down to pre-pandemic levels of 2019. We thought, okay, well, we're doing okay. Things are back down, right? even though they're still higher than you want. They're back down, but then things have started going up again. Yeah, they are. They're still about 15% lower than the peak, which I think was in May of last year. But that's still three times higher than the price pre-pandemic. So depending on how you look at it, yes, I guess prices are lower than they were at the peak, but they're three times higher than they really should be. Or they were two years ago. Right. So that's causing, you know, a lot of stalled construction projects. I don't know about what's going on down in South Alabama where you are, but here in New England, I see a lot of buildings that have just stopped. You know, the foundations are in, and I guess they're waiting for the price of lumber to come back. Well, well, I have seen a lot of um, stalled construction, but then again, you turn the corner and, well, right, right across the river from me, I see a big house being constructed there. So at some point, right. people are going to build. They have their dream set up. They have their financing set up and they're moving ahead. And that's the other thing that a lot of people are trying to get ahead of any of the interest rate hikes that might be right around the corner, even though they're supposed to be very modest in their increase in pricing. It still can make a big difference if you're building a home. And, you know, so many people ask me why, you know, is it just greedy lumber barons that are deriving the price up well that may have a little bit to do with it but but when you think about the reasons behind these problems is that the sawmills you know didn't think there would be so much work happening during the pandemic so they backed away from their capacity that they were able to put out and then they've been trying to catch up but then the labor shortage makes it even harder for them to really stock up all of the people they need in these sawmills to create everything so the sawmill out put significantly behind, but hopefully they will get all back in shape, get people in there working, and be able to catch up with the demand. But uh, it's it's quite the phenomenon that we're having to deal with and really hurting a lot of people that are trying to improve their home. Yeah, and you're right. The sawmills, when the pandemic hit, they had a slight miscalculation. They thought that once the pandemic hit, everything was going to shut down. So they dumped all their lumber, all their stock they had. They sold as quickly as possible because they didn't want to get stuck with it. And then just the opposite happened. Suddenly everybody was home working on their house and they thought, "Uh uh-oh, now what? How do we start up again? And they've been trying ever since. And this most recent rise, according to the National Association of Home Builders, 
this rise in lumber prices adds eighteen thousand six hundred dollars to the price of a newly built home. Wow! So yeah. that's not making the home any better or any bigger, but it's costing almost nineteen thousand dollars more. Well, traditionally, a lot of times when you hear about interest rate hikes and you hear about high lumber costs, that really drives a lot of people to look around what they have and start remodeling and improving the house that you're in. Right. If you're along that mindset and thinking about that, well, here on today's homeowner, we have a lot of information to share with you that that you know ways that you can really improve your home without spending a lot of money or a lot of your time and until we can kind of get through this um the cycle of really high prices and then you can revisit some of those more let's say labor intensive projects that you have there now um a week or so ago we had a homeowner that was having a problem with squirrels i'll tell you those squirrels can cause you so many problems and and they're just so unpredictable on things that they will chew away on at your house and one of the callers had a situation where she had fiber cement trim a lot of people know it as the brand name james hardy siding and the squirrels for some reason were kept just attacking this one trim and there was a lot of ways you can go there is squirrel repellent there's different homespun recipes and all but we love Love it when someone that's listening to the show calls in with a recommendation on that. And that's what we have right now we want to share with you. Howdy, this is Lon Rodine. I'm in Colorado Springs. And there's one thing that works on rodents and skunks, and it also works on raccoons. And that is Irish Spring Bar Soap. You just cut the bars in half and just lay them out wherever you have the infiltration, whether it's inside your house or out. It works. It works 100% of the time. I've had trouble with squirrels. I've had trouble with mice. And they don't even come around. And it lasts quite a long time. And it's super cheap. And it works. Take care. Oh, there you go. Wow, that's great. I love that. We appreciate that, Lon. We appreciate you calling that in. And, and you know, one of the things I think about, well, first of all, soap is, you know, fairly inexpensive, especially if you go to some of the outlet areas like the dollar stores and things. You can buy a number of bars of Irish Spring soap. And, you know, I kind of like that soap myself. I guess the squirrels just don't like that whatever fragrance that is that it puts on. Right. That's why the squirrels keep running when Danny walks out of his house. They take <laughs> off. They go, to, they go to the neighbor's house. But, you know, the thing about it is so many times they'll have, you know, you talk about pepper spray, spraying right. yeah. different um, cayenne pepper and things like that, different homespun remedies. But, you know, the first time it rains, that's gone. Right. Whereas with the soap, um, yes, it'll eventually dissolve, but it almost enhances the smell and so forth of the Irish Spring soap if it gets a little water on it. So Right. You get a nice lather for the squirrels. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they might, you know, be out there taking their little shower and things that's like right. that, seeing it. As long as they're not chewing on the siding, whatever it, whatever it takes. Right. As long as they're not chewing on the siding. We've, uh, <laughs> we've you know, we've done two things. We've, we've prevented additional damage <laughs> and provided entertainment for those that like to see squirrels dancing around singing in the shower so well we had presented with squirrel tables last last year when they're eating at the table they have to clean up so they eat at your squirrel table and they go to the irish spring they clean up they wash themselves up and then they go take a nap yeah, I saw the funniest thing that sure. somebody, I can't remember the actress, somebody really, really well known, and apparently she went to a fundraiser, maybe had a couple glasses of wine too many, right. and she walked out with six squirrel picnic tables. No. She bought the entire inventory, <laughs> and, and they have a picture of her with six picnic tables walking out with it and a big smile on her face. So she's going to take care of the squirrels in her yard. They're having a, oh, good. a whole little squirrel festival out there. And, any something. listener that missed that, just go to... To Google and type in, I think they're just called squirrel picnic tables, right? Was there some other name? And it's basically like a little tiny table you screw to your trees and the mm-hmm. squirrels come and sit there and eat. And I guess people find that really entertaining. You can reach out to us anytime by sending us an email. Today's homeowner.com slash ask is where you need to go to send that email in or you can just pick up the phone anytime 800-946-4420 that's what Rhonda in Naples Florida did Rhonda welcome to the show and tell us what's going on around your house there thank you we just purchased this stucco vacation home in Naples and the stucco is in perfect condition there are no cracks there are no chips nothing it's all perfect the previous owners planted jasmine around the at the arch mm-hmm. of the covered entrance, and it's secured with fishing wire, and it's attached to anchored screws. When we pulled off the jasmine, we're now left with these small jasmine pieces and screws that are secured with anchors. We tried to brush those pieces of jasmine with small wire brush, but the jasmine has kind of grown into the stucco. My question is, how do we remove the jasmine pieces that have grown into the stucco and how to repair the holes in the stucco after we remove the screws with the anchors? 
Okay, it's a great question, and I can see the picture here. And You know, it's amazing. I've uh, seen this happen a lot where, uh, especially change of ownership, where the previous owner loved the vines and loved that, but, you know, maybe a new homeowner wants to remove it. I've seen the same thing on stucco fencing and that type of thing. And uh-huh. it's amazing how they the roots can get down in to the pores of that material and, and uh, makes it very, very hard to get it off. First of all, you know, a lot of scraping or abrasion and so forth – um, is going to hurt it a good bit. And of course, Mother Nature is going to help a lot in removing all of this. And I'll get Joe's recommendation on how to really get that off and to accelerate that deterioration. But, you know, on the holes that you have there, the lead anchors, you can take a, um, a needle nose pliers and just play with those lead anchors and they'll pull out of there. You can just kind of collapse them a little. They're, they're, it's soft material. And you can mm-hmm. get that out of there. And then probably the easiest and best thing to fill those holes to keep you from seeing them is a caulk mm-hmm. just basically fill it up with caulk and then you may even play with the caulk a little bit while it's still wet to make it look a little bit like the finish that you have on the stucco so um, a lot of times you can take a small piece of carpet and dab on it that ah. creates a, t- a texture like that um, sometimes a paper towel is enough just to kind of make it look a little bit like the surrounding surface allow it to dry well and then the challenge then of course is to um, do the touch-up painting so that it blends in with the color of the stucco that that might be the trickiest part of it but they can always mix you a small a quart of paint um, to the color just so that you can dab it on like that with a small brush the previous owner actually left us some paint oh good so that shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Good, good. Hey, Joe, what do you think about all of this leftover jasmine roots and so forth? Um, I know after a while the sun, the rain, and the wind will right. take care of it all. But how can you maybe accelerate that process a little bit? Rhonda, the first thing you want to do is you don't want to just start tugging on these because if they're still a little green, meaning not completely dead and really dried up, you can wind up pulling off because they grow. Be surprised how deeply they can grow into or behind that wow. stucco. And the last thing you want to do is pull them off and then chip the stucco now you have a stucco repair and the same thing goes with those anchors the way i've removed those anchors before is you back the screw out maybe just a little bit like a quarter inch then you can grab the screw head with a pair of pliers and pull out the screw and the anchor at one, one time but again as danny mentioned be really careful move it around a little bit left to right start to loosen up that anchor because if the anchor is in really deep and you pull it, you're going to pull off a big chunk of stucco. So I'm just warning you, just be really careful with that. But as far as once these tendrils, sometimes they call them suckers, but these tendrils that have grown into the stucco, once they're, they've been dead for quite a while and you know, you know, you can feel that they're kind of dry and cracking off. I mean, the easiest thing is really just with a stiff bristle nylon brush and soapy water you can usually clean off most of it. And I also heard that people have used, not bleach, because you don't want to use bleach, but they've used pool shock. It's like a chemical they use for shocking pool water. It's right, cal- right. It's calcium hypochlorite is the active ingredient. But you can dilute that and put that on there, and that really kills them and makes them easy to remove. But I, I think I would just use soapy water, a brush, and get it all off that you can. So one second, I just want to ask you, you're saying that we should wait for it to dry, like for a week or a month or so? Yes. How long ago had you removed this jasmine? Uh, a week ago. Oh, yeah. I think you're going to have to wait. And, of course, if it keeps raining or something like that, it's, it's going to be an issue because it won't dry out. And if it's not in the sun, it won't dry out. But I would think just wait until you, you grab a couple pieces and you see they just snap right off nice and dry. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Because you don't want to cause more damage than you have already. That's for sure. Right. Oh, this all makes so much sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, good, Rhonda. I hope we've been able to help you a little bit on that. And uh, best of luck 100%. and have some fun on that second home down there. Thank you so much. I just want you to know how much I enjoy your show. It it comes on very early in the morning in Nashville, Tennessee, where I live, but I get up for it every single Saturday. (laughs) We appreciate you being one of our viewers there. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, Rhonda, well, you have a great weekend, and we hope to talk to you again. You take care. Right now, we're going to switch right back to the Today's Homeowner Hotline, which you can call anytime, 800-946-4420. That's where we have Russell in Virginia. Russell, welcome to the show, and uh, tell us what's going on around your house. I live on a slope, and I have a problem with moles and voles. Uh, They tear up the ground, and when we get a heavy rain, the dirt will be compromised, and it causes ruts that are kind of treacherous to encounter when you're walking down the slope. And they also go around, I have a big concrete slab, 
and they go around it, and they compromise the integrity of the concrete. Isn't it amazing what those things can do? I mean, they just must work all the time. I guess they don't sleep at all, or, or they <laughs> sleep during the day and work all night. I don't know. But, uh, Joe, we've talked about this quite a bit we have, in yes. the past, and it seemed like it just pops up a couple times a year. Um, what do you think in the research that you've done is probably the best thing for Russell to try? Yeah, Russell, as Danny said, we've answered this before. And you said you have moles and voles, or you're not sure which you have? I think the moles uh, make the tracks, and the and the voles come behind them, and they eat the grubs. And I got a lot of grubs. Okay. And so uh, they work together, I think. And <laughs> yeah, maybe they've unionized since uh, yeah. they first came onto your property, and they're working together. But I think what you've got, actually, moles are carnivorous, so they'll eat the insects and grubs and earthworms. So what we, if you have moles, and moles, by the way, they're, they're always underground for the most part. And so what we always tell people to do is, well, if the moles are there, they're there for a reason, right? So it's the grubs. So you have to use a pre-emergent herbicide to kill the grubs, and then the moles won't have anything eaten to leave, and they'll leave your property. Voles, on the other hand, are vegetarians. They only eat the stems of plants and roots, and they're typically above ground. They look, they look more like field mice voles so you'll see them scurrying around look like little short fat field mice where the right. um right where the mole that's a vole a mole they're like got like paddle shaped feet and little tiny eyes and you know and because they're underground the whole time so i suspect what you probably have are the moles and they're eating the grubs so you have to get rid of the the grubs first with the, the herbicide. If you wanted to trap and kill the moles, then you'd have to get you know the not, not nice devices, but they have spikes that are spring loaded and they stabs them right through and kills them. You know, and then you have to pull them up, and it's not a pleasant experience. But that is one way if you want to trap them and kill them. I did have another question about around my concrete. The ground washes away, and I've been filling it in with uh, pea gravel. And is that a good thing to do, or is, is there a better idea for that? Well, if you're going to use gravel, I wouldn't use pea gravel because that washes away too quickly. I think you need something that could pack down more tightly. Okay. Yeah, that's probably exactly. That does help on the drainage aspect of it, though. And, and of course, you can always dig down a little bit and put concrete around it as well just to kind of bolster the whole foundation of that. But uh, as Joe mentioned, uh, hopefully some of these ideas will solve that problem because they can create just an absolute mess in your yard. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Russell, for being with us from uh, Smithfield, Virginia. Today's Homeowner is brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. It's time for our best new product segment brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. Sometimes the simplest improvements can prove difficult to complete because of the hassles of installing a simple accessory in your home. That's why I love it when a manufacturer thinks about the homeowner and makes the installation process as easy as possible. That's what the Home Decorators Collection has done with their new Snap Install Hook Rack. It's a decorative four-hook rack that's ideal for hats, scarves, or just about anything that you may need to hang and a great place to fill up a little space on your wall. And what makes the installation so easy, it is a rail mounting system with an integrated level. You simply place it on the wall where you want it, level the rail, and drive screws through the pre-drilled holes, preferably into studs, but wall anchors work as well. Now then the decorative rack just snaps into place over the rail to complete the project. Secure mounting with no visible fasteners. Now for more information on this Home Decorator Snap Install Hook Rack, log on to homedepot.com. Another way that you can do a little decorating, a little functionality in any room that you may have. Right now, we're going to West Virginia. Bonnie's on the line. Bonnie, welcome to the show, and tell us what's going on. I understand you're considering a garage project here. Well, it's not really a garage floor. It is a patio floor, and mm -hmm. it is a, it's cement. And I've seen an episode of where you had did a garage floor, and you put these speckles in the floor. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you was, I, I don't know, I can't remember if you did it while you was painting or exactly how you did it, but I came up with that idea. I thought that's what I was going to do, but I need to be reminded how you did that. <laughs> oh, okay, certainly. I'd be glad to, and that, that is a real popular project. And I'll tell you, we've been getting so many emails from homeowners, over the last, especially over the last few months, about how to make their concrete surfaces look a little better, whether it's patio, front porch, um, you know, driveways, you know, sidewalks, whatever. 
And I'll tell you, there's been products in the past, epoxy coatings, that you mix up, you pressure wash and clean the uh, the concrete, you apply this, and then you sprinkle the little uh, sprinkles on top of it. Well, I think anybody that's ever used this realize it's not that easy getting a consistent sprinkle job out of these things, just like putting sprinkles on a cake. It's hard to get it nice and even. So um, what we found and what we've been using more than anything and probably what you saw on our television show is us applying one of the Deitch coatings. Deitch is a sponsor of ours and been friends of ours for quite some time. And they really do have it figured out because it's all integrated into the paint, into the coating. They have really good directions on exactly how to go step by step. And even most of the tools and supplies that you need are included in their garage floor kit. So I would go to DeitchCoatings.com and that's spelled D-A-I-C-H. And you'll see a lot of videos on how to apply. They have actually several different kinds. I, I put one in my garage in my new house coating that's a kind of an almost an industrial type that almost has a, a faux finish to it. But because of the texture of the roller pad that came with the kit, it left a little slight texture on it to where you don't have any issues with slipping and falling. It gives you just a little bit of grip, but still very easy to keep clean. So, um, Bonnie, I think that's what I would consider. There's a lot of different colors and styles that are available. It'll make that patio look phenomenal. Well, great. Great. That sounds good. See, that's more than what I knew before. <laughs> <laughs> and it's easy to do. It's easy to do yourself, like anything. Just read those instructions. You can knock it out in a weekend, and uh, you'll be pretty proud of that patio area. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you taking the time to care for this little person in West Virginia. <laughs> oh, any time. Any way that we can help you with, with you or anybody there in that neck of the woods, we're happy to do, and you can reach out to us anytime. And Bonnie, I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you, and you too. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm sure she can find videos online on the uh, Today's Homeowner website of you applying this uh, finish, right? Oh, yeah, no doubt. We've got a number of different videos there at todayshomeowner.com as well as Deitch coatings.com. Let's go right to St. John's, Florida, and uh, Art's on the line with us right now. Uh, Art, welcome to the show, and I'll have to say I was in St. Augustine just around the corner from you there uh, just this past week, and the weather was fantastic. Yes, it was very nice. Well, tell us what's going on there on the outside of your home. So in the front of the house, we have two columns that are entryway, and these are cylindrical in shape. And at the bottom of them and at the top, there's two rings. And what's happening, the bottom ring keeps on separating from the upper ring. So there's always a gap at the joint. I've tried different types of caulks, acrylic caulks and silicone caulks, but no matter what, when the weather changes from warm to uh, cool nights, it separates. So I was hoping you might have some suggestions of how to fill that gap in. Okay, well, um, yeah, they, it's amazing how much expansion and contraction you can have on different elements of the home. And you would think with a, something significant like columns, there just wouldn't be that much movement, That, but there is. Well, I'll tell you, just earlier in the show, we had uh, talked to a homeowner about using Duramaster. This is from Titebond. It's something that we tested recently and shot some videos on. Pretty amazing stuff. It's really made to be the most flexible, pliable caulk that's available for outside use. And um, it worked very, very well in all of the tests that we did with it and very extremely durable. And uh, so I, I would consider that Titebond Duramaster. And you can go to Titebond.com, find out you know, where you can get it uh, in and around uh, the Jacksonville area there. But um sure works really, really well from what we've done. Okay, that sounds great. I assume it's paintable? Yes, uh-huh, certainly is. A um, little bit of drying time will be necessary. Read those instructions on that. Probably good to let it dry, you know, overnight. And um, just cut a good clean cut on the end of that uh, caulk tube and just feed it in there, dress it out, and just leave it alone for a day before you touch up the paint on it. All right, great. I'm excited. I want to try it because I've been challenges with this for a few years now and you just cannot solve it so this is great news i will check this type bond out all right good good all right okay i'm glad we can help you on that if we can help you any other way just let us know we're glad to do so okay well thanks a lot you know that's one of those things joe we talk about a lot you know probably people come and go from art's house and right 
They never see a crack in the column. But I guarantee you when Art leaves and comes back, <laughs> uh, he's seeing it every time. That's the way it is with a lot of little projects around the house. But I think we have uh, gave him a solution on that one. He's been battling it for a couple of years. Hopefully the Durabon will, will solve it when it, and it will dry and still be flexible enough to accommodate any movement in the column. Let's go back to another email here, and we'd love to get an email from you. All you have to do is go to todayshomeowner.com slash ask. George in Maine writes in, I'm installing a new hardwood floor in our 1,200 square foot home, which has a poured concrete crawl space. I'm concerned about moisture issues, so I'm putting plastic sheeting down on the floor and up the walls of the crawl space. My question is, uh, would it also be smart to staple plastic to the underside of the floor joists? There's currently fiberglass insulation between the joists. Thanks, Danny. I listen to you guys every weekend, and I trust your advice. Thank you so much, George, for that. And uh, right away, I can tell you, do not staple any plastic to your floor joists. That is going to trap moisture, and that's exactly what you're trying to avoid. Now, putting the plastic down on the floor and if it laps up on the sides of the crawl space, all of that's good. You're preventing that moisture from migrating up. But Joe, this does sound a bit odd that he's talking about that um, he has a poured concrete crawl space. I'm not really sure right. I have ever seen that before. Yeah, I guess it's just like a really shallow basement. Right, just there's a poured concrete floor, I assume, and I assume, yeah, uh-huh. it's always a good idea to bring that plastic up onto the walls, but don't bring it up onto the wood because again, they're going to be trapping moisture. And the only thing I would suggest beyond that is maybe replace the fiberglass insulation with rock wool insulation, which is much more moisture resistant than fiberglass. I'm not sure why there's so much moisture. That's another issue he might be address. He should address whether it's adding more vents, adding a powered vent, adding, you know, in, try to get more ventilation in and out. You know, even with blowing air in, blowing air out. So that that's another thing he should really first is address why is there so much moisture in that crawl space. Yeah, that's one of the key things that we always encourage you that next time you have a good heavy rain, put on that rain suit and the, grab the umbrella, walk around the outside of your house and make sure water is not pooling around your home. If it is, it's going to find its way under the house and you're just going to have excess moisture that you could probably, you know, avoid by building up around the perimeter of the home, diverting that water away away from the home. That's a very key part of it. And I've seen many, many situations where water ponding next to a home eventually causes some foundation shifting, and that's when it really gets serious. So one of those things that you can avoid right now by making sure that water rolls away from the house. Here's another email from Kevin in uh, Minnesota. Hi, I own a bungalow-style home with a stucco finish. There are a couple places where the stucco is chipped and blistered off. Is there a way that I can patch these areas myself? If so, what should I use? Kevin, the answer is yes, but it is tricky depending on the texture. A lot of times you'll have a, um, a real mild um, kind of slight texture to the stucco. Other times you'll have more of an aggressive type. That's what you have to match. Now, um, Quickrete has a number of products that are available for stucco patching, and you might try, um, you know, a small amount of that, apply it to the areas that are chipped, and then you've got to play with it a little bit. I mentioned earlier in the show about the use of a small little piece of carpet that you can use for texturing. Other times you might have to use a trowel in order to, you know, test it all out. But the real trick to everything is touching up the paint after you've gotten that texture looking good and it's dried adequately. Joe, you know, they've painted it before, good. They should know the paint they have. Right. But if you're trying to match a pigmented stucco color, that can be a little bit harder, right? Yeah, especially because it's probably weathered. And regarding the quick creep, yeah, they do make a pre-mixed, I think it's just called stucco patch. Uh -huh. and it's only about eight, $8 a quart, which goes a long way. It is recommended for hole, filling holes and cracks up to a quarter inch. So beyond that, you, you know, you might need another product, but I know the premix stucco patch is great. It, it's flexible and it does, does have a sand texture in it, Danny. So when it dries, it does pretty much blend in with a typical stucco finish. There you go. And pretty easy way of trying that. Just make sure you get it nice and clean. Make sure any of the loose particles are away before you start applying the patch. When we come back, hey, it's spring and we're going to talk about a few things you may want to do around your house this weekend to really get ready for the great weather ahead. From installing a smart garage door opener to installing a bathroom faucet to removing a tree 
The Home Depot believes you can do anything, especially the things we have how-to guides for. Visit homedepot.com for thousands of tips, workshops, and ideas for projects, big and small. The Home Depot app, how doers get more done. Yes, it's finally spring. So glad that we're able to start getting out of our house a little bit more. But there's a few things that we're going to recommend that you consider doing at your home. One of the first things you need to do is go right now to todayshomeowner.com slash four seasons and download our spring checklist. What you'll find is what we've considered our top 10 must do's that are very simple projects that you need to do around the house. We also have a if time and budget allow a few other ideas and inspiration for you. And if you have a little extra time, a little something extra, some things that is perfect time of the year to do those. But right now we want to share with you with you, our top 10 must do. One of the first things, of course, your air conditioner is going to be working harder. Make sure you have all of your air conditioning heating system serviced by a professional. It'll save you money in the long run by making that system last longer and work a lot more efficiently. While you're at it, make sure you clear away any leaves and debris from your AC condenser unit outside and make sure that it's going to do a really, really good job. Then, Joe, gutter is pretty important this time of year. Absolutely. After a long fall, in winter it's probably clogged up with leaves and branches and twigs who knows what so you have to clean out the rain gutters and the downspouts make sure they're all the water's flowing well make sure they're pitched properly and attached to the fascia so the water will flow off and then while you're cleaning that also clean debris off your roof you might be surprised how much stuff collects on the roof especially if you have trees growing very close to your house and you'll be opening those windows making sure your screens are in good shape good and clean and clean around the track maybe a little bit of lubricant here to make sure those windows are working really well. Another thing you might not think about is cleaning the lint from your closed dryer exhaust pipe. Just move that dryer forward. Make sure that you clean out, even though you may clean that lint screen out every single time you dry a load of clothes, it's still a good idea to make sure that lint moves out of there so that it works efficiently and it'll be a lot safer in doing so. And you also want to make sure all the locks, exterior door locks are working well. But don't spray lubricant in there. That's often the first thing people do, but that just collects dust and dirt and makes the locks harder to work. What you want to use is graphite, powdered graphite. It comes in a little squeeze tube and you squeeze it in there and blow this dust in there and work it back and forth. If you're going to lubricate anything, you want to lubricate hinges, gates, that kind of thing, garage door rollers. Usually we recommend white lithium grease, but don't put it on the track itself. Put it on the rollers. You only you always lubricate moving parts, not stationary parts. And while you're at, the, at it, you might want to take a look at your garden tools and sharpen them because they work a lot better when they're sharp and inspect the condition of your wheelbarrow, specifically the tire. Make sure it's pumped up full of air. The handles aren't cracked because you'll be using them a lot this time of year. Once you have all of that ready to go, then get out in that flower bed, get your flower bed and plants all ready to plant. And another simple one, this costs you absolutely nothing. Reverse your ceiling fans to make sure they are running counterclockwise as you're looking up at the fan. That'll push air down and keep you a lot, lot cooler. And that means that's going to save you a lot of money. So this is the four seasons of home ownership spring checklist. And you can download yours right now. Today is homeowner.com slash four seasons and all of the items that we mentioned there is only going to take you about eight hours and cost only a hundred and twenty dollars for materials and you can buy those materials at home depot as a matter of fact this segment's brought to you by the home depot how doers get more done right now let's get to our podcast question of the week this comes in from milwaukee wisconsin trent asks i'm renovating our house and will be installing a new tile floor in the kitchen which has a peninsula and is open to a dining room area There's also a doorway into the kitchen from the hallway. My question is how to lay out the tiles to create a balanced pattern. I don't want to end up with narrow slivers of tiles along a wall or door threshold. Any tips would be appreciated. Well, you know, Joe, this is a good one, and I'm sure one that you explored and thought about in the great tile book that you wrote a few years ago. But, you know, um, the the general rule with uh, installing a floor that has a pattern is to start in the middle and then work away from the middle so that on either end you have the equal size right. uh, material. But sometimes in a situation like this, you might have to actually start at one of the more prominent areas that 
is common with the adjacent area with full tiles and work it out that way. A little tricky without actually seeing this layout, but so many times, I mean, it's a good concern Trent has in not having any of those little bitty pieces right where you have the most traffic. Where, where, what would you do to point him in the right direction, Joe? Well, first, there's a lot of dry fitting that has to be done in uh-huh. a case like this. Dry fitting simply means putting the pieces, in this case the tiles, in place without any mortar so you can move them around. And although there's a way absolutely to avoid a small sliver of tile, which is a sure sign of an unprofessional job, so you don't want to do that, but you probably won't have a perfectly balanced pattern, meaning you might not start with a half tile and end with a half tile. You might start with a half tile and end with a quarter tile or so, which would be okay. Um, And the reason you might have to do that is because you're avoiding a sliver of tile, in this case, up against the peninsula or at the where it meet, the floor meets the dining room. So, um, but as you suggested, the best thing is to start with the most prominent area. Like in this case, maybe it's the entrance into the kitchen or entrance into the dining room or from the kitchen into the dining room. And start there and try to get the most balanced pattern where you're using as large a tile as you can around the perimeter. And then you can shift it back and forth. So, that I mean, it's hard to describe over the radio how to do that, especially without being in the kitchen to see exactly um, how big it is and where these obstacles, so to speak, are. But you can usually shift the pattern back and forth, again, going in one direction, then in the other direction, and lay out as many tiles as you can to see what happens once you reach the peninsula or once you reach the cabinetry on the other side where the kitchen is. Um, and then and with a little trial and error in dry fitting, I'm sure Trent would get the pattern that would work best for his kitchen. And that's really, when it comes down to it, it's a lot easier than trying to measure it out. Oh, forget measuring, yeah. You know, just laying them out. Visually, you can see exactly, you know. And, and don't forget the spacers. Yeah, you're right. right. You make sure you're spacing it out right because that can throw it off when you go across there. But Trent, that's what we would suggest. Go ahead and get the tiles out carefully, place them around there, and you'll be able to work it out, I'm sure, without having any concern about any of the little slithers that you might have, which can be problematic in those high traffic areas. Danny Lipford here along with Joe Truini, and we really want to say how much we appreciate you spending some time with us during your busy weekend. We know there's a lot of options out there, a lot of things you can watch, you can see, you can listen to. There's so much out there we appreciate you spending some time with us and this is one of the special times when joe can share with us another simple solution joe share away all right danny it's important to test the ph value of your soil in the garden or in the lawn at least once a year to make sure it's not too acidic or too alkaline now you can certainly buy a soil test kit at any home center or hardware store but i'm going to tell you how you can make your own using baking soda white vinegar and water All right, so here's what you do. You start by adding a little soil to a clean container. It could be like an empty plastic water bottle, something like that. Just a little soil, and then pour in half a cup of vinegar. If it immediately starts to fizz and bubble, then the soil is alkaline, and you need to amend the soil with sulfur, pulverized sulfur. If there's no reaction, take a second clean container, add some more soil, pour in half a cup of water, and mix it well. Then add half a cup of baking soda. Now, if that starts to fizz, then the soil is acidic, and you must must amend with lime. If there's no reaction after shaking this up, after conducting each test, then the soil has a neutral pH, and there's no need to add any amendments, and you're ready to just start planting. Boy, that just takes all the guesswork out of, you know, planting. And, you know, almost all plants that I've found, and I'm not a gardening expert by any means, is that pH level should be around 7. Right. And there's a few times it's, you know, you want it a little more acidic, you know, uh, here and there. So it's always good to do the Im- information on that. But what a great, simple solution. And you have over 500 of them waiting on you right now at todayshomeowner.com slash simple solutions. And you know, some great tips are, are available there, like, you know, if you're about to do some remodeling projects, some really cool tips on how to minimize the dust and the mess that people think is inevitable when you're doing remodeling. But Joe's got some great tips there at Simple Solutions to be able to help you with it. Also, you know, when you're doing a little painting, how to keep that paint roller clean, how to unclog an AC drain line. You need to pay attention to that coming up when we start really using that drain line and how to make a junk drawer device 
lighter that can keep that, that drawer you have. You know what I'm talking about in your kitchen there, uh, and it's uh, quite a mess. Well, you can organize it a little bit with a very simple way of going about it. Hey, that's going to pretty much wrap up the show for this week. We really appreciate you, you know, communicating with us, talking with us, and letting us know, and certainly appreciate all those great reviews we continue to get each week. We appreciate it. I'm Danny Lifford, along with my buddy Joe Truini, and thanks so much for listening to this Today's Homeowner Podcast.